This week, Jeff and I get into it about how the internet is bound to change in the coming years, and we'll break down two-factor authentication for you in an easy-to-understand way. Becca's here to share some of the tech stories we're following this week, including a Hyperloop in Canada, Adobe deleting user files with their latest update, and WSL2 backported to Windows 10, 1903, and 1909. Plus, Robert's here to help beginners learn to research cryptocurrencies. Stick around. It's time for the tech. Our live recordings are trusted only to solid state drives by Kingston Technology. Revive your computer with improved performance and reliability over traditional hard drives with Kingston SSDs. Category 5 TV streams live with Telestream Wirecast and Nimble Streamer. Tune in every week on Roku, Kodi, and other HLS video players. For local showtimes, visit Category5.tv. Welcome to the show, everybody. Great to see you. Nice to have you here, Jeff. Good to see you. Good to be here. Having a good week? I had a great week. Oh, good. Yeah. What about you? I'm doing pretty well. Yeah, it's been quite a couple of weeks. Yes. Yeah, we had to skip last week. Yes, that's true. (laughs) Ah. And for those who are wondering about that, um, we were battling with uh, Internet Service Provider. And so uh, that caused some issues that uh, I had to make the call last week to forego the show, which is a really, really hard call to make. But as, you know, we, we do try to do the show live and you know, such a way that we're able to broadcast to you at home. Uh, that, that unfortunately put a kink in our plans. It does make it hard to go on the internet without internet. Yeah, this whole internet without internet thing is, is really, really tough. First world problem. Don't know, yeah, I don't know how it works. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it is, inter- I mean, maybe they're probably not related, but it's funny, the last week, my internet at home has yeah. been dropping probably every hour. It's been it's been weird here. Like we've had some weird I- issues, and and even um, so much as the local ISPs had uh, DNS outages. Really, DNS. It's all it's it's DNS. Wow. Yeah. So you know we're trying to get online and and accessing websites and and everything else, and and there's no DNS responsiveness from the ISP. So, but but only at certain points. So only if you're trying to access certain areas of the web, you say, well, but you use Pi-hole, so that should be able to bypass that because I've got my own internal um, DNS server. But the problem is, is that the routing still has to go through the ISP. That's right, yeah. So if their internal DNS is not responding, then all of a sudden it breaks down somewhere in Toronto. And, uh, and, and here, we, here we are. Yes. And I understand there's been some issues with uh, AWS, Amazon Web Services yes, in the UK right. as well. Um, so if that's affected you, that's really tough. Yeah. And, and it's, a, it's an interesting thing. Like, we're, we're so cloud-based now, and you say, you know, what is the cloud? Well, really, it's just a grouping of very, very powerful servers. Mm-hmm. AWS being one of the world's largest because right. Amazon is huge and AWS is their cloud platform for host, uh, like hosts. Um, so, you know, my websites are uh, largely, you know, our back end is powered by Amazon Web Services. So, right. uh, fortunately, here in Canada, uh, we weren't affected. But good. those who are hosting on AWS, I believe it was in the UK that I think that's correct. It yeah. it was down. So their servers are completely down. So you've got infrastructure that is built upon this platform that you expect is always going to be up and it's not. That's right. Necessarily. Google had it happen where a lightning strike actually took down some of their cloud. That's right. A couple of years ago. Yeah. But it resulted in like a 0.0001%, I don't know if that's the actual number, but data loss at their data center and so that's it yes but when you consider the scale of google yeah fair enough okay it can be huge right (laughs) that's true so and and the advantages i guess with cloud hosting is that well partly you've got a little bit of an out if 
something goes down. Yeah. As a as a provider, as a service provider, you're able to, okay, well, you know, there's a pretty large amount of sites that are affected by an outage at Amazon Web Services. For sure, yeah. If you self-host and your server goes down, there's no excuses. That's, that's it's, right. It all falls on that's you. That's right. Yeah. But there's a certain level of... I guess, like community understanding that, hey, oh, well, if AWS is down in the UK and I can't access your UK-based website that's hosted there, then oh, it's Amazon's fault. It'll be back up tomorrow right. kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. It's tough. But that's, that's the, that's the infrastructure in. of this internet. Do you ever sit there some days and I, I realize I'm like going off on a tangent out and I just wonder Already? what's... Already? We're not even a minute in. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but do you ever wonder what's going to be like the next iteration of the internet? The next iteration of the internet. Yeah. I think the next iteration as we see the technology progressing as far as bandwidth capacity goes. Okay. And we're going to be learning a little bit about some of the advancements there uh, with the newsroom today. Because there's such a high demand for bandwidth right now, yeah. people who are working from home understand that your your you know your dropouts may be the result of all of a sudden the ISP is handling a lot more traffic because people are now working it. from home. You think about an office. So let's say we've got an office with 50 people working. That's one internet connection that everybody's sharing. And right. so if there's problems, it affects that one office. Right. If, however, you've got now all of those 50 people working from home, we now have 50 internet connections. And those internet connections are doing what? Any guesses? When I work from home, what do I do? Stream Netflix. I do that. <laughs> Game. But I tend to remote in to oh, my office. Oh, yes, that's right. right? Okay. So that one internet connection now at my office that used to have 50 people sitting there has now got potentially up to 50 people remoting in from home, mm. accessing that same internet connect, uh, connection to be able to work from home and remotely access their files and their computers and things like that. So you've got this whole kind of like bottleneck happening on the internet. So what's next for the internet? As, as things get faster, as things get like richer as far as the available bandwidth goes, are we going to see improved, well, improved performance automatically turns more impressive services? Yes. When high-speed internet came along... Changed the world. Yes, but Netflix, that you used to be able to order a DVD and they would mail it to you and, right. and you, could, you would rent movies from Netflix. This yeah. is how they got their start. So it was, it was like a website that you would order a DVD and they would send you that DVD. Yeah. You would watch it just like you rented it from Blockbuster and then you would return it. That's right. Then now it's all online. Then high-speed internet came along and you know what Netflix is now. Yeah. So what is going to progress? How are things going to change? How are things going to improve? Like what is next? It's all, you know, who, who knows what's going to improve? What's going to change? I keep thinking it's going to go completely wireless. If mm -hmm. you can remove that physical cable uh, Are we challenge. there yet? Are we already there? Uh, <sighs> to some degree. I mean, uh, I use Wi-Fi. Yeah, the lot. tech is there, but I think from an infrastructure standpoint, we're not there. There's a whole lot that would have to come in place to make that more sure. reliable. But at the same time, you've got, um, is it... Um, uh, Tesla working on their satellite network yeah. that's going to hit the globe. Not Tesla, but uh, SpaceX. Yeah, yes. SpaceX. Sorry. Yeah. Same same CEO. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> same same Twitter. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> same shenanigans. That's right. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I think it's going to be wireless, and I think it's going to allow bandwidth to go so much faster. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how it progresses over the years and, and what mm -hmm. changes. What's uh, what's really kind of catching my my eye is this COVID app that we've got in Ontario, mm -hmm. actually I think it's across Canada, for that randomly connects with Bluetooth. So that if you've walked near somebody that has mm. tested positive for COVID, you get an oh. alert that goes, hey, you get, don't, don't interact with that person. Well, no, you get an alert that says you recently interact with somebody who has been tested positive. Oh, wow. So this is happening all in the back end on your device. And, I'm, and mm. so I was thinking about that going, this is just with Bluetooth. Is there a way to have almost like 
hot spotting as you go mm. with mobile phones that would allow this constant wireless network to be like pew, 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 pew. so interesting i mean a couple of things come to mind jeff first first of all when you start talking about wireless i start thinking about man that would be so expensive but the interesting thing is that with the progression of technology and the the betterment of the underlying infrastructure the cost to the end consumers goes Drops. down yeah. yeah so we're going to see that price go down so maybe my my smartphone and the ability to connect to 5 6g internet is going to drop yeah and when that happens now all of a sudden autonomous vehicles become much more autonomous that's right because they're internet connected all the time with a high speed internet connection yeah and and then we've got all these new new technologies that can just open up that's right yeah. and things like these apps that that communicate but then the second thing that comes to mind is now you've got everybody calling big brother Oh, of course. You're there now. Yes, yes. But where is the line where we say, okay, well, we want Big Brother to some extent. I want Google to be able to tell me if an earthquake is going to hit in California. Absolutely. If I, I live that. in California. Yeah. It's smart. And, and so the, there comes a point where you say, okay, well, I'm, gonna, I'm going to allow Google to have access to my telemetry. Yeah. But then how much trust are you putting in this company? So, so there's, a, there's, the, yeah, there's, a, there are all these considerations. I think in general, the human race, uh, as, as a broad brushstroke, so not everybody, but as a broad brushstroke, I think we're always going to go with the times of advancement. I mean, you look at when. As a whole. As a whole. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at when Facebook came out and it changed the way that we do online permissions. It used to be you had to give permission to access your information. Yeah. And with Facebook, they said, no, no, you need to give us, you need to tell us what you don't want us to share. And now, and we're going to, and we're going to change that every six months. Exactly. And you're going to have to be on top of that because That's otherwise right. you've basically opted in because you're using our free platform. That's right. And it's changed the internet. Now everybody does that where it's like, you tell us what you don't want us to share. You tell us what you don't want us to have access mm -hmm. to. And I think in general, most people, again, general broad brushstroke, uh, most people are like, you know what? It's the convenience of it. I'll deal with it. And they just, yeah. they, they seem to want to ignore it. That's my sense of things. So I think if we get to that point where it's like all of that information is just kind of bouncing between phones, I don't know if too many people are going to care. Hmm. It's going to be interesting. So I, I've often been of the mindset where it's like, I don't do anything that I would be a, afraid for somebody to know about. Right. But. There's also like identity theft and, and yeah. tracking and, and the ability for, you know, the big brother to see, you know, the trends of my lifestyle, where I go, where I buy my coffee at what time, which then boils down to, okay, well now you know where I'm going to be. Right now, all the data would say, wow, that guy sits on the couch a lot. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I practically get up and stop at Starbucks and, and sit at my desk for oh, 10 hours. Ever since That's COVID. That's my day. Yes. And then I'm at the studio working, working, working. Yeah. 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 Anyway, didn't what mean are, to take us on a tangent. What are your thoughts? I mean, it's, it's an interesting discussion. I mean, because this is, it's a transition that is happening and, yeah. and is going to happen. And I think the pandemic has also kind of pushed us to need change in regulations in the infrastructure and in the technologies that are there mm -hmm. and so you know how is that going to impact us as a society as as people as individuals and and you know what are what are your thoughts comment below it's a good discussion to have with the community oh for sure absolutely it is mm -hmm. yeah anything new as far as tech goes jeff <sighs> for the first time in like 12 years i bought a laptop you did. I finally bought a laptop. He's bought a laptop, folks. I, I know. When everybody else is like, ah, we don't want PCs anymore. And finally, Jeff is like, okay, I'm going to buy a laptop. I, I know it sounds stupid that like I just bought a laptop, but I the, the laptop that I bought last was 2007. And I have wow. kept that thing on life support for as long as I possibly could. I'll say. Because I, it's like, it, you know, Windows got too clunky. So I put Linux <laughs> on it. Then it started to not be able to handle the Linux. So I put a, a downgraded, like, light version of Linux. And, mm -hmm. and I just, but now it's at the point where it just doesn't want to start off. It's, yeah. it's dead. But mm -hmm. I, I, for some reason, I have this weird mentality where it's like, 
I want to get as much as I can out of my tech as possible. Sure. And, you know, why just put more e-waste out there? And I know that there's ways to recycle and whatnot, but it's like if I can... Which has become progressively more difficult now as well. I, I, I've got e-waste sitting in my house from six months ago. Mm-hmm. I can't get rid of because of COVID. Yeah. It's like, I don't have COVID, but I want to get rid of it. Tough. So really, uh, really tough. Yeah, it is. So yeah, that's, <clears throat> I bought a laptop. Very cool. Yeah. And thinking about laptops and, and also the progression of internet connectivity and the ability to remote in and things, the way that my paradigm has shifted is that I've taken a different approach. I imagine you've probably bought a reasonably powerful laptop. Yeah, that's uh, middle of the road. It's an i7, okay. uh, 12 gigs of RAM, I think. Middle of the road. Middle of the road. Well, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an i7 with hyper-threading and eight cores and well, 12 well, gigs of RAM. And I, come on. Okay. I wanted to get, like, you know... It's got to last you. Exactly. Yeah, I wanted something I like if I buy a laptop every 13 years. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky 13. So how has the paradigm shifted for me? Well, for me, Jeff, it's a $200 Pine Book. I see, and I, Pine I Book Pro, to go that way. Will. Super sleek, right? Yeah. Like, look at that. If I, if I hold that just right, it disappears. Yeah, pretty much. You can't see it. Um, and what I do with this is I tap into that new style of infrastructure. So I have a very, very powerful desktop PC. That's right, yeah. And I access it from this laptop. So anywhere that I am, I'm able to bring up DaVinci Resolve video editing yeah. and working with the power of an i9 9900K with <clears throat> 64 gigs of RAM from a Pinebook Pro. Yeah. So on the screen, it feels like I'm working on an i9. But meanwhile, it's this lightweight $200 Linux kit that's powered by an ARM processor. And I wanted to go that route simply because I've been drooling over those since they came out. Mm-hmm. But for what I need to use it for, it's just not powerful enough. Um, and this is it. Uh, like, so that's why I use it to remotely connect into my more powerful devices. I don't have a more powerful device. Mm. So. so it's just a change in the paradigm. It's yeah. just shifting the paradigm and, and realizing that. And, and then using single board computers. So I've got Raspberry Pis and Odroid XU4s. I've got lots of those because yeah, those are probably my favorite board as far as like the universal Debian server goes yeah. uh, with USB 3 and, and everything else. Um, and, and then accessing them from there. And, and I've got access to as many systems as I have. I'll tell you what, I'll trade in my laptop and I'll get a pine book if you let me access your name. Yeah. <laughs> and I, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> it's a win win. But see, when my internet goes down, now I've lost everything. Yeah. That's... I am, I'm a fish out of water. I don't know, like, what do I do when I have no internet connectivity? Because now from my pine book, I can't do anything. That's when you go, darn it, Jeff's so much better than me. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, can I borrow your laptop? <laughs> That's right. Oh, mm-hmm. good times. <laughs> For me, I've been I've been teaching myself how to use a 3D printer. And, oh, and so I know, it's arrived. Well, no. The, oh. Well, this is the thing. Is is my my experiment is I want to know. If I were to get a 3D printer, is it going to be so onerous for me to learn how to use it that it becomes another one of those technologies that I purchase mm. and then never use? Right. Because we fall into that, sure. right? A cool tech comes out and you want it and you buy it and then it's too hard to learn and you don't have time and it just sits on a shelf somewhere. And then it becomes obsolete. Yes. So I've taken a different approach and said, okay, well, I'm going to learn how to 3D print first. Okay. And then I'm going to working with designs. make that decision. So yes, working with designs. Okay. Very cool. So I use a tool at tinkercad.com, which is made by the Autodesk folks. Yep. And it allows me to use my web browser to do 3D designs. Cool. So what ideas have you come up with? So my original ideas are very, very basic, Jeff. As you can imagine, I mean, I'm just learning the ropes. But so, so, and I mentioned this two weeks ago when you were here, that I was going to do this, and I've done it, is that uh, in my laundry room, I wanted a place to hang 
face masks because we have we've got three kids at home yes and we all have five or more of these i think i've got like 10 of them myself because i'm working in the field and the kids each have five yeah face masks but we bought the washable ones and you don't want to put them through the dryer so right. i want to make a, a rack for them so i've designed i haven't printed because i don't have a 3d printer but uh, this was the experiment can i design the, the idea that comes to mind, which is uh, a half-inch piece of PVC pipe yep. hanging in the unfinished laundry room. So I've got access to the rafters. I can just screw right into them. And so I designed the, um, the well, the mechanism, the plates to put the half-inch PVC up on the ceiling okay. hanging and the hooks that are going to hook onto that to allow us to hang as many masks as we want. Very cool. So it is kind of cool. So it feels like something that... I. Hey, I'm I'm actually designing. I'm actually creating based on a need, based on something that I probably couldn't just walk into a hardware store and buy, and probably doing it a lot cheaper. I, there's the cost of a 3D printer, but as yeah. BP9 mentioned in on on the Discord earlier today, the the fact is is that even though there's an investment in the 3D printer, which is pretty cheap these days, yeah. you can go to our website category5.tv, click on shop, you'll see an Ender 3 V2 there, and they're not very expensive. So mm -hmm. The, the initial hurdle of like the investment is there, but fairly quickly, as you design and print things, you're going to make that back. Of course. That's yeah. the idea. Yeah, that, and that I, makes sense. I'm really seeing that as I, as I look at things in online shopping yeah. and think, could I, this is the challenge that I've given myself, could I create that myself with a 3D printer? And then I start looking at, okay, well, that thing would cost me $20 and I could print it for 20 cents. Right. So how hmm. quickly could I make that back? It's an interesting hmm. experiment, but, but I've proven to myself that one, I can design things. I can take my ideas. Very, very basic right now, folks. You can see the designs that I've done at uh, thingiverse.com slash bald nerd. Uh, you can see my designs, but you'll see the hooks that I made and the, the mounting apparatus for it. Um, and then I've also taken it one step further and I've taken other people's designs because you can get onto thingiverse.com. Yeah. You can find things that are close to what you want, then load them into your software, in my case, Tinker, tweak it. Tinkercad for now. And, uh, and yeah, tweak it, modify it, change it, make it so that it suits your purpose. Very cool. It is kind of cool. So I'm at that point, I think, where it's like, yeah, I can, I can do this. Yeah. So now when I do make that investment, when I get the 3D printer and I, and I set that up and, and, and I'm ready to print, I'm ready to print. I have designs. I've proven that I can design and, uh, and I'm good to go. I like that. Interesting, right? So Tinker, cool. tinkercad.com is the software that I'm using for now. Yeah. It's probably rudimentary in so many ways, but it's really, really easy for me to get my feet wet when it comes to 3D printing. You got to start somewhere. And then I talk with Bo Lechnowski from Ameridroid, and he's telling me about how he programs 3D designs. He uses software that is so much more sophisticated than what I'm, uh, I'm doing through my web browser. Right. And is able to actually tweak things by adjusting numbers in the, in the program. And it, that is, but that's why he's able to now, he's able to do things that I can only, I can imagine, but I, I'm not capable of yet. Right. Right. Bo's a cool guy. Yeah. Oh yeah. Thingiverse.com slash bald nerd. Check out my designs. We've got to take a really quick break. Uh, when we come back, Jeff and I are going to have a discussion about two-factor, multi-factor authentication. For those of you who are wondering, hey, what is this thing that my service provider keeps telling me I should activate on my login? Uh, we're gonna have a quick chat about, uh, about why you might actually wanna consider setting up two-factor authentication. Stick around.
Welcome back, everybody. Uh, just a note, if you are a participant in the Category 5 TV Coffee Break, it's a community time to get together and have a chat. And we try to do it every Sunday, and, uh, and we do that faithfully. Now, this coming Sunday, uh, unfortunately, it is, um, it's canceled. So uh, <laughs> there will not be a Category 5 Community Coffee Break this coming Sunday. But watch the website. We'll be updating the calendar there, the schedule, so that you know exactly when the next one is, uh, which will be a week from this coming Sunday. So just keep that in mind. If you're planning to be there this coming Sunday, there will not be a coffee break. You can still make coffee, though. Oh, that's okay. please do. <laughs> yeah. Pour me a coffee, folks. That's right. In this quick... In this quick discussion, uh, we, we want to help you to understand two-factor authentication, what it is and why it's critical, uh, critical and uh, why it's not actually as complicated as it sounds. Right. Uh, so we all know this is Robbie. Hi. Uh, so Robbie, what's your password? My password, Jeff. Should I really tell you? Yeah, you have Win to. Winston 2075. Really, really easy for me to remember because Winston is the name of my beloved cat who left us a year ago. I remember Winston. He was a good cat. Uh, but I don't get the 2075. 2075. Well, that clearly, Jeff, is the uh, the year of the Linux desktop. Oh, clear, clearly. Oh, clearly. Oh, burn. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess that makes perfect sense. Uh-huh. Uh, okay. So now that, uh, you know, our viewers of the show, uh, you and I, we all know each other. Um, if we kind of walked uh, down the street, we see each other, I would say, hey, uh, I'm Robbie. What? Yeah. 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 I'd say I'm the bald nerd. And uh, you would say, um, I don't think so. And I'd say, but really I am. My password is Winston2075, mm. uh, which obviously is correct. Right. Yeah. Um, How do you know this? But you still don't believe that I'm Robbie. So uh, there's one thing that I didn't think of, and that's the fact that you know what Robbie looks like. Uh, and you know that clearly I'm not him. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't grow a beard like that if I tried. <laughs> when you sign into your online account, you've got typically a username and a password, right? right. Um, so that's basically so that the server can tell that it is you that is logging in. Right. Your username is often something that is publicly accessible. So that could be your email address or in my case, like it could be bald nerd, right? Um, so that username is not something that is a security factor whatsoever. Of course. Anyone can get that. So um, anyone who knows your password can say, okay, well, my username is bald nerd and my password is Winston2075. Right. So now they can access your account because those are the only factors that you have, basically just the password. Right. The plot thickens if you've got the same password on other services as well. Which so many people do. Uh -huh. Don't do that! Yeah, and that's why we say do not have the same password on other services because if you get compromised on one, you're now compromised on, other. but, on others. But um, the other thing is that let's say they're able to get into your email. Yes. Something like that, right? So now all of a sudden uh, they can go on to other sites, your online banking and things like that, and they can click on forgot password and they're going to be able to reset your password and gain access to those services as well. So with the username and password combination, the server itself, so the connecting server, whether it's like your online banking or Twitter or Facebook or whatever it is you're logging into, it has no way of actually verifying that the person who's logging in is in fact you. Right. Yeah. They know the username and password and so they are given access, right? So two-factor authentication, sometimes called multi-factor authentication, uh, it can be intimidating, it can sound kind of complicated, but really um, it's just a way for the online server to recognize that when, uh, when someone is logging in as you, that it is, in fact, you. You, right. Um, so the server is able to say, yeah, that's the right password, but I know Robbie and you're not him. Right. Okay. So then how do we do that? And really it comes down to that the easiest way is something like this. Something you already own, your smartphone. Uh, 
Right. How many and, of us have a smartphone sitting in our pocket right now? Exactly. So you, you might be watching the show on your smartphone. You've got it on you all the time. That's right. It's your, it, it, that is probably my wife's biggest complaint about me. <laughs> <laughs> it's, that it's literally on me all the time. But that's convenient when it comes to this. Absolutely Security. it is. Because right. even though somebody might be able to obtain your password and your email, uh, because that's not really impossible it's a lot harder and less likely that they're going to have physical access to your phone. Mm -hmm. So with two-factor authentication enabled, once you enter your password uh, and your login for the account, you'll be uh, prompted to obtain and enter a, a code from your phone. Could it come in through text or you know, maybe through an app, whatever. Yeah. Uh, but you know, your phone becomes that second factor in the authentication process, which makes it two-factor authentication. So it's not really as complicated as it sounds. Online services um, such as Google Drive, yep. uh, Gmail is uh, is part of that. Um, we we talk about Amazon and AWS. That's right. Yeah. Twitter, Facebook, your online banking. They all support multi-factor authentication. So you want to look online and check your settings and see if you can set that up. And uh, if you're having trouble finding the way to set up multi-factor authentication. Just reach out to the service provider yep. and they'll be able to give you help. Yes. It's a really, like it's not the end all be all solution, That's but it's an excellent way for you to better secure your account so that as somebody else tries to access your account with your username and password, if they ever get it from a phishing scam or by a man in the middle attack or something along those lines, well, they're not going to be able to access your account because they don't have your phone. Yeah, That's right. It's a really, really smart thing to have. And one of the things, uh, because I've run into the two-factor authentication with my kids. Yeah. Um, when we upgrade our phones, we'll hand our old phones to them. And it's yep. their gaming device, their whatever. But because there's no longer a phone number attached to it, sometimes with some of their services, every once in a while, it's going to want a phone number. Mm -hmm. And so for the longest time, I was giving them my cell phone. Oh. So I'll be at work and all of a sudden I get a bloop. And it's, you're trying you know, to log in. <laughs> here's your code. And I was like, oh, yeah. I got to call one of them. Right. Now, obviously, you know, you have to look for the services that you're going to enable it, this road that I'm about to mention. But I found a service, like a, an application that gives you a, a, a digital phone number where it will then come through to your phone, even though you don't actually have cell phone service. So you don't, I, my, like my kids don't have a okay. physical phone number, yeah, yeah. but they have a service on their they phones. Have like SMS. Yeah. So they can get text messages cool. to a phone number. So now they can put in their own two factor authentication. Right. Now, if you're going to go down that road, because maybe you don't have a phone, but you've just got a tablet or something. If you go down that road, make sure that what you're using is a trusted source sure. because otherwise an untrusted source is going to have that number. Yeah. They might be able to do a man in the middle on your SMS. That's right. And right. you don't want to do that. So you want to pay attention to the sources you use. Uh, and, and in our case, uh, it was magic Jack. Okay. Because you can get a magic Jack phone number for free. Yeah. Uh, a U.S. number. Mm -hmm. So that's what we used. Oh, neat. Yeah. And just magic Jack is trustworthy. We, we've been using them for gosh, 15 years now. Wow. So, cool. you know, now my kids have the magic Jack app and they put mm -hmm. a phone number in and Oh. Interesting. Okay. So I've taken a different approach and I use the Google Authenticator app. Okay. So which, you've got the app route. Yeah. And so with that app, it uses what's called OTP or one-time password. Yep. So when I log into any of my two-factor authentication enabled uh, services, it then prompts me for my multi-factor authentication code, my OTP. Oh, okay. So then I bring up the app and it shows me a, a one-time password that I now need to enter into that service in order to access it. Very cool. Which has the same effect of, okay, well, I don't need to have them texting me. Right. I don't have to worry about that man in the middle attack. There's so many different ways to set up two-factor authentication. Yeah, it really is. But the, really what it boils down to is just the fact that, you know, somebody is not going to have access to the SMS messages going to your child. Yeah. Somebody's not going to have access to my phone with that authenticator app. So it's just finding one that works for you yep. and setting it up so that you've got uh, that multi-factor authentication so that you're protected because really, I mean, these days, wow, it's incredible how many phishing scams are out there. Yeah. Um, I get emails just to put it into perspective. I get emails that appear to be from my boss. Okay. Oh. From my employer with links 
yep. to click here and, and, and enter my info. And they, these are called spear really? phishing yeah. scams. So these are some hacker or somebody is trying to gain access to my account. And so they've researched me and they've learned about me and they've learned about who my employer is to the point where they can now send me an email masking and pretending to be wow. my employer and saying, hey, click here. So when you put that into the perspective of an auto shop and yeah. the service technician gets an email from the boss and maybe is not as... Um, security conscious? Well, security conscious, but also just like, I, I, am, I know what to look for. Yeah, that's fair. You know, so I, I know, okay, well, this is definitely not coming from my boss. And I'll look at the email headers and things like that because I understand them. Yeah. But uh, what if that, and just using the shop technician as an example, okay, um, what if they fell for it? What if the accountant opened that fake invoice that gave them access to the username and password for their email? Again, they can use that the hacker can use that to then gain access to other accounts because they can do forgot password. That's right. Or they can send email as that user and, and take it even further. And this is how ransomware happens and things like that. It's true. So spear phishing is where they learn enough about you or your company to be able to make it look completely legitimate. And yeah. that happens a lot. So what happens if that shop technician falls for it and gives out their username and password? Well, if they have two-factor authentication enabled on their accounts, yes, the spear phishing attack has now got your username and password. However, when they try to access it, it's going to prompt for that two-factor authentication. So in the SMS example, right. the shop technician is now going to receive a text. Yes. And they're going to say, well, I didn't request a login. That's right. Huh, that's weird. Yeah. Um, or in my case, it's never even going to, I'm never even going to know about it because they're just going to be notified that they need to enter their one-time password. That's right. And they're not going to have it because they don't have my phone. That's right. So some food for thought. When you're thinking about two-factor authentication, multi-factor authentication, just set it up. It is absolutely required these days. you got to stay safe. And really, there's no excuse not to. Really isn't. We all have a phone in our pocket, Jeff. It's true. And if you don't, for some crazy reason. There's an app for that. <laughs> there's an app for that. <laughs> there are ways. You'll find it out. And that's why I say talk to your service provider because they will tell you uh, the various ways that you can set up multi-factor authentication. Yeah, that's true. Very good. All right, we've got to head over to the newsroom. Here is Becca. Here's what's coming up in the Category 5.TV newsroom. An update to Adobe's Lightroom app for iOS has wiped user photos with no chance to recover. WSL2 is now available for Windows 10, 1903, and 1909 users. The world's fastest internet can download the entire Netflix library in less than a second. Hands-free driving could be made legal on UK roads by spring. And a Hyperloop may be coming to Alberta. Stick around, the full details and this week's Crypto Corner are coming up. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. From the newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. The latest update from Adobe's Lightroom app for iOS inadvertently wiped users' photos and presets that were not already synced to the cloud, and Adobe has confirmed that there is no way to get them back. The issue first cropped up on the Photoshop feedback forums last week when the Lightroom app on iOS was updated to version 5.4. A user posted asking why all of his photos, presets, and watermark data had been removed after updating to the most recent version through the iOS App Store. This was followed by replies from other users saying that the same thing happened to them, whether or not they were uh, subscription-based or free. One user posted to Reddit's r slash Lightroom subreddit Reddit, saying that they had lost two plus years of edits after the update. Having spent more than four hours speaking with Adobe customer service, they report that Adobe finally said the issue has no fix and that these lost photos are unrecoverable. Adobe provided nothing more than an apology. Confirming the user's claims, Adobe officially confirmed the issue on Wednesday, explaining that customers who updated to Lightroom 5.4 on iPhone and iPad may be missing photos and presets, 
that those photos and presets are not recoverable, and that they sincerely apologize to users who have been affected by the issue. Version 5.4.1 has already been released, fixing the issue, but it can do nothing about the lost data. This serves as a strong reminder for photographers to always have a backup of your images in multiple places, so you're never subject to a single point of failure. Mistakes like this happen even at some of the world's largest companies. Microsoft is easing the requirement for Windows Subsystem for Linux 2. Instead of only working on Windows 10 2004 or higher, WSL is also now available for Windows 10 1903 and 1909 users. Windows 10 users who wanted to work with the new Windows Subsystem for Linux version 2 needed to have the latest feature update for Windows, the Windows 10 May 2020 update, aka Windows 10 20, 2004. But on August 20th, Microsoft made a surprise announcement. WSL2 has been backported to Windows 10 1903 and 1909 as well. As it turns out, Microsoft has been working on bringing SL2, uh, sorry, WSL2 to 1903 and 1909 for the last few months. They said in a blog post that the goal is for the backport to make WSL2 available to more Windows users. The backport will be for uh, x64 systems only. Those using ARM64 still need to use Windows 10 2004 to get WSL2. WSL2 is a much reworked version of the original WSL. It changes how Linux distributions interact with Windows. As officials noted in today's post, each Linux, uh, Linux distribution running on Windows 10 can run as WSL1 or WSL2 and can be switched at any time. According to Microsoft, WSL2 provides a full Linux kernel built into WSL2, improved system call support for all Linux apps, including Docker, Fuse, rsync, and more, and improved file system uh, performance. To get WSL2 for 1903 and 1909, users simply need to check for updates via Windows Update. A team of University College London engineers have set a new world record internet speed, and you won't believe how fast it is. They've been able to achieve internet transmission speed a fifth faster than the previous record. The, the research team, led by Dr. Lydia Galdino, achieved a data transmission rate of 178 terabits a second. That's 178 million megabits a second. Compare that to the 50 megabits you're getting at home. At 178 terabits per second, it would be possible to download the entire Netflix library in less than a second. The record, which is double the capacity of any system currently in use worldwide, was achieved by transmitting data through a much wider range of colors of light, or wavelengths, than is typically used in optical fiber. Current infrastructure uses a limited spectrum bandwidth of 4.5 terahertz, with 9 terahertz commercial bandwidth systems entering the market, whereas the researchers used a bandwidth of 16.8 terahertz. To do this, researchers combined different amplifier technologies needed to boost the signal power over the wider bandwidth and maximize speed by developing new patterns of signal combinations that make best use of the phase, brightness, and polarization properties of the light. In this way, they were able to manipulate the properties of each individual wavelength. A huge benefit of the technique is that it can be deployed on already existing infrastructure by simply upgrading the amplifiers that are located on optical fiber routes at 40 to 100 kilometer intervals. It would be shockingly cheap to perform such an upgrade. Upgrading an amplifier would cost around 21,000 or about $420 per kilometer if we upgraded every 50 kilometers. Compare that to installing new optical fibers, which can, in urban areas, cost up to three-fourths of a million dollars per kilometer. Lead author Dr. Gal Diner, Dino, a lecturer at UCL and a Royal Academy of Engineering Research Fellow, said, While current state-of-the-art cloud data center interconnections are capable of transporting up to 35 terabits a second, we are working with new technologies that utilize more efficiently the existing infrastructure, making better use of optical fiber bandwidth and enabling a world record transmission rate of 178 terabits a second.
The speed achieved is close to the theoretical limit of data transmission set out by American mathematician Claude Shannon in 1949. I want that bandwidth. Right? Install that at my studio. You, you know, it, it was, it's, <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, I mean, there's two things that kind of jumped out at me about this story. The first one, uh, what Becca was kind of getting to about um, $24,000, I think, for 50 kilometers or per kilometer, whatever it was, um, to, to do the upgrade. The math was there. Yeah, it was there. We've butchered it so far. But uh, that's right. But significantly cheaper significant. to, to make this upgrade than to lay new fiber. Well, yeah. And so interestingly enough, uh, this summer, or I guess this spring, when, when COVID kind of brought the world to its knees, uh, at our my church, we were looking to stream uh, once we started getting back into the building. Mm -hmm. We had really slow internet, like half meg upload. Ouch. Yeah, right? So we reached out to different ISPs and we said, okay, what would it take to run, you know, first we looked into fiber, then we looked into DSL, then we looked into cable, the one kilometer, actually I think it's 0.8 kilometers from the junction box at the corner mm -hmm. to where our property line was. Mm -hmm. And every quote we got was six figures or more. Yeah. And I'm like, we're talking a kilometer. Mm -hmm. And then I'm hearing this and I'm like, this is amazing. But at the same time, the fact that it's utilizing light and I mean, here we are yeah. in a studio with light bulbs all around us. Mm -hmm. Now they're all LED, so that's not quite the same thing, but how neat would it be if this technology could be advanced to the point where we're getting our internet off a light bulb? If it's, <laughs> if it's through, <laughs> like... How neat would that be? Like it's slow... got to be a little more refined than that. I, I mean, fiber optics are. Very, I very I agree, but you look at where the internet was twenty five yeah, years ago. Yeah. Like imagine fifteen years from now, you flick on a light and boom. <laughs> <laughs> like how, oh, Jeff? Your predicament that you have at your church or that you had, uh, presumably you found a solution at least we to get you by. LTE. Oh, okay. So you're wireless. Yeah. So you're getting about twenty megs per second. Uh, 20 up, 45 down. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's not bad. That's no. pretty good. No, we but can stream and it's good. Expensive. Yeah. Wouldn't it be cheaper? This is just a crazy thought, but buy the property on the corner that's near the junction box. Buy the property and have them run a six foot length from the junction box <laughs> to a little <laughs> tiny tower and put a ubiquity antenna on that that is pointed at your church that has like air fiber, you know, what which is like gigabit a second. You know, it's funny. We, ha we actually have our sign there that we rent from the person who owns the property. So put a little ubiquity antenna on top of your sign, connect it to the fiber, and you'd have to have like some kind of a box that powers everything yeah. and, and keeps it secure from... It's, it's got a powered light anyway. Well, there you go. So now put <laughs> it... So then that. beam that, beam that to your church. You can get gigabit per second internet. For the cost of huh. a six foot length of fiber run. <laughs> I actually think the box is like a foot from the pole. Well, there you go. That's your answer. <laughs> Where were you six months ago? <laughs> I don't know. Nobody asked me. I mean, this is just what came to me just now. But oh, hey, lots of more exciting stuff coming up. Hands-free driving could actually be made legal in the UK. I mean, like legit wow. hands-free driving. Uh, also, speaking of transportation, a hyperloop could be coming to Canada. What? In Alberta. Oh. Becca's got these stories coming up. Plus, Robert's here with the Crypto Corner. Don't go anywhere. Welcome to the world of cryptos and welcome to the Crypto Corner. Now, as you probably know, that there's not one boring week in cryptos. But let's take a look at it. Where are we standing today? So, if we look at our favorite website, which is uh, CoinGecko, and we see that the market is going down a little bit since yesterday, 2.5%. Uh, we're at 373 billion uh, US dollar. Uh, Bitcoin went down uh, since last week by 6.4%. And if we sort by seven days, We've got the usual picture, a lot of coins going up over, I mean, in this case, 145.2% in a week. And on the downside, well, this time it'll be a little bit more than uh, last week. But nevertheless, I mean, I know that everybody of us goes and he listens to um, so-called influencers, people that pretend they know what they're doing and 
and well, I recommend you this coin or that coin, and you see that suddenly that coin went through the roof, and you say, hey, why am I not in this year? Well, it's very simple. These people are all are good guessers. They do some research, but there's not really one expert that can tell you where the market is going or what's happening. You are relying, you have to be reliant on yourself. So you have to do your, the research yourself. It's good, as I mentioned to you last time, to listen to other people and see what their thoughts are. But at the end, it's you, you have to do the research. And I promised you today, I would show you how to do research. So the first thing, and I've got, I prepared a small uh, image here. The first thing you have to do is you go on coingecko.com. As you see, coingecko.com. And uh, because they, they're the best, they've got the most information and their information is fairly reliable. So this is where I would start. And then you select the coin that you heard somebody shilling, recommending, whatever. And let's take here, for example, Algorand. <clears throat> you heard that that coin is a very good one. So you get a lot of information already on this page here. Like uh, on the, on the right-hand side, <clears throat> you get uh, market information, price information, um, that is very valuable. When was the all-time high, uh, the all-time low? Um, on the left-hand side, you've got the usual chart of what's uh, happening, uh, the market volume. But here you, get, you see some goodies. So you see the website. So the first thing I would do is I would go onto the website and see what the website is telling you. You don't have to understand the technical details. Most people don't understand it, but just see whether that makes sense, whether you would like to put money into somebody that is promising you something that you're interested in. So that's the first thing I would do. Just browse around the website. They're all the same. There is, they're all very flat. You don't see many different things in here that might go into some technical things, but you can ignore that um, at the beginning. Next one is uh, the community. So that's where other people are voicing their opinion. So you go into Reddit um, and uh, see what's happening there. So here we see that something was posted 23 hours ago. Um, this one here, okay, this is an ad. Uh, one day ago, one day ago. So it looks, seems fairly um, uh, populated. So things are happening here. Next one is Twitter. Twitter is the central point of uh, communication in the crypto industry. So Twitter is a must. You have to go in here and just check what the official Algorand team, in this case Algorand, is doing. So, so they published something 18 hours ago, then here 23 hours ago, then August 22nd, so that's uh, now three days ago. So they're pretty ac uh, active in the market. Here's an interview. Just listen to what that interview uh, has to what was discussed in that interview. So that's a good indicator. Next one is Telegram. Telegram is where people like you and I are uh, uh, talking. And um, so just open, the, the, download the Telegram Telegram app, and um, and just look into what other people are saying. I mean, you see a lot of people in there with some stupid opinions. I mean, you see here in this case, there are 9,200 members and 1,281 are online. That's a good indicator. And uh, just just browse through that uh, Telegram. And Discord is similar to Telegram, a little bit more complicated, a little more complex. Last but not least, <coughs> click on GitHub because that's where you see the programmers uh, working, doing their job. And you see here somebody updated a uh, file one hour ago, 10 hours ago. So you see they are very active also in what they're doing. Now, <clears throat> this will give you the basis of the information on, um, on how you can take a decision, whether that's a coin that you would like to invest money in. Similar things you do with cars, similar thing you do with a house. You don't buy a house if I tell you you have to go on 43rd Road. You don't go there and just buy a house. You do your research the same way. And so do the th same thing here. It's very simple. It's much easier than in the traditional stock market. As you can see, there are only a few areas where you can go and really do something. So yeah, that's it for me to this week. So I hope you liked it. I hope you learned something. I wish you another fantastic week and I hope to see you next week again. Thank you. Bye.
Thanks, Robert. Just a reminder that we're not providing any financial advice here, just sharing what's happening in the cryptocurrency market. Always remember that the cryptocurrency market is always changing. It's always volatile. Uh, so only invest what you can afford to lose. Now back to Becca. Thank you, Robbie. The UK government has said hands-free driving could be legal by spring of next year. The Department for Transport has issued a call for evidence into automated lane-keeping systems. Such technology controls a car's movements and can keep it in lane for extended periods, although drivers need to be ready to take back control. The Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders claims it could reduce the number of accidents. The technology for a car to steer itself and stay in lane even around curves already exists in some modern cars, but the law says that drivers must remain alert and ready to take over instantly. Tesla's so-called autopilot is one well-known example. It is considered level two on the five defined levels of self-driving cars. The next step, level three, would not need the driver's attention at all times, and in theory, the driver could do other things, such as check email or even watch a movie, until the car prompts them to take over again. Introducing those systems would require changes to current legal framework, something the DFT says it is now considering. While the technology has been approved by the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, it is limited to traffic jams at speeds of up to 37 miles per hour. The change could give the go-ahead for speeds of up to 70 miles per hour in the UK, potentially making long stretches of tedious motorway driving a thing of the past. The UK government wants to hear from people within the motoring industry to decide how to safely implement the technology. The consultation closes on October 27th. The government in Alberta, Canada is backing the development of a high-speed hyperloop between Edmonton and Calgary. Albertans could be among the first Canadians to travel by high-speed pods between cities after the government of Alberta signed an agreement with Canadian transportation tech company Transpod to develop and test a high-speed hyperloop between Edmonton and Calgary. Though no financial commitments have been made by the government, Alberta will support Toronto-based Transpod by sharing data, identifying land, and participating in discussions with potential investors, according to the news release. The project involves a short-term feasibility study ending in 2022, research and development ending in 2024, test track construction in use between 2024 and 2027, and the construction of a line between downtown Edmonton and downtown Calgary to begin in 2025. There are a handful of companies developing this technology, which allows pods to travel at high speeds in a low-pressure tube, with various projects in the early stages around the world. This would be the first such project in Canada. The vehicles would travel up to 1,000 kilometers per hour with an average speed of between 400 and 600 kilometers per hour. Alberta's Hyperloop line would stop at the Edmonton and Calgary airports, as well as Red Deer, he said, and the total moving time of the full line would be a half hour. The system would be powered by a mix of solar panels and electricity and would mainly transport passengers and time-sensitive goods like ma mail or e-commerce products. The $6 billion to $10 billion project would create jobs in a province where many oil and gas workers have lost their jobs in recent years, and position Alberta as a potential hub for technology. Big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5.tv newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And if you appreciate what we do, become a patron at patreon.com slash category5. From the Category 5.tv newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. Well, thanks for being here with us again this week, everybody. Just a reminder, there is no Category 5 Community Coffee Break this Sunday as previously scheduled. And uh, it's been great having you all here. Yeah. Nice having you be... here again, Jeff. I, you know what? I feel like I should probably just start coming back. Yeah. Yeah. And we're figuring out how things can work yeah. through this current time. Jeff and I are kind of physically uh, distant from one another. We've got about six feet between, um, between our heads. Yep. 
<laughs> and if you see him leaning in, you see me leaning back. <laughs> we do our best and, and try to remain socially distant here at the studio and wear our masks when, uh, when we can't be. Yep. Um, and, and figuring out kind of the technology and how everything is going to work. And I think you're going to find that this week things are looking better than ever. Certainly they're sounding better than ever. Oh, and yeah. that is largely to do with Ameridroid's uh, Easy Portal having been installed in the studio, now we're able to get the cables between the studio and the bridge. And so our audio receivers for our microphones are now here in the studio with us rather than going through a steel studded wall, which was yeah. causing some interference and some dropouts here and there occasionally throughout the show. So that's why things are sounding a lot better. As far as uh, looking a lot better, we're doing, uh, well, our lighting is now almost set up. So we're about 50% there. Um, so what we are seeing now is a lot different than what you've seen in the past. Those of you who support us on Patreon or on Kickstarter, you already know kind of how things are looking here in the studio. But beyond the camera, we're seeing lights mount. Well, you can see all the shadows. Yeah. <laughs> Notice how many shadows there are of my arm. So there are lights everywhere. And we do have some, some soft boxes mounted on the ceiling. And, and so lighting in here is significantly better. Five, six, seven. Seven lights and then that weird U-shaped thing. The weird U-shaped? Oh, the, that the, thing yes. for, for the outside that's, light. And it's actually got an LED uh, pointed down on it that's actually reflecting back yeah. to us. So yeah. that's what's giving us that. And nice we have the natural thing. light. And we've been able to turn off the fluorescent lighting. Here yes, in the studio. which so is that's nice. a big difference here. So when you think about um, lighting uh, a production studio, um, having uh, like sunlight balanced white clean light is very, very important. Yes. Um, so when we first moved in here, of course, we're using the, the built-in lighting, which is like 3,500 Kelvin. So mm -hmm. it's like really, really poor lighting for video. Yeah. Um, and now we're starting to starting to be a little bit better. So, so where are we at with that? Um, really, I mean, Jeff is looking around and saying, oh, well, why haven't you turned on that light? Why haven't you turned on that light? And that's because the ones that are mounted um, that are going to be DMX controlled haven't yet been wired in, and oh, that's okay. because we're still waiting on hardware. There's uh, still um, mount, um, electrical hardware that has to come in because right. things take a while to arrive. It's true. They yeah, do. and I we've, love the I love the boom. Like you can't yeah. see it, but there's a boom for the overhead camera for product reviews. Yeah, we've got that. a jib crane that has a, an overhead camera that we can move around. Uh, that's it's, awesome. it's pretty cool. So uh, that's going to give us that overhead when we're doing unboxings and product demonstrations and things, so that you can see from above. Um, and that's going to be uh, quite a bit better than anything we've ever had. So that's going to be cool. So now, speaking, you mentioned Kickstarters. Mm -hmm. Where's the tens machine? <laughs> I've had three I'm people sourcing, ask me this week. I'm sourcing one that goes up to eleven. Yeah, I, three people have approached me this week. They're like, "When when are you doing that labor thing?" Oh yes, yeah. Fantastic. So I I, th Fantastic. I think I think my wife is starting to like poke people and be like, "Hey, you need to ask Jeff." <laughs> All right. Because I'm so, trying to make everybody forget about it. I'm going to talk to, to your wife about no, that. But you know what? She's busy. Don't worry about it. But I need to talk to her about it. And you know why? Is because we have to be socially distant. It's such a weird time. So where... We, we could just put this off. It's okay. Do you really think I'm going to give him the controller and say, okay, Jeff, shock yourself? I, I can make Eat it look... one with a really long cable. Or I wireless. can make it look really good on camera. I'm going to connect it to a Raspberry Pi GPIO and give you access to be able to control it. BP9 is going to be like, ludicrous <laughs> <laughs> speed. <Yes. laughs> Crank that up to 11. Oh, I can't wait. We're going to have a lot of fun, folks. We've got a lot planned and uh, everything in our world has been kind of put on hold. But throughout this process, we've been doing our level best to make sure that we sh we're still bringing you a show when we can, as yeah. best as we can. Still trying to um, to bring you good content every single week. And uh, and really, when, when it comes down to it, when, when things all come together and they're coming together, it's going to be like a sigh of relief. And now let's broadcast. Let's do the show the way the show is meant to be from Studio E. Yes. It's going to be incredible. And I can't wait. And I'm thinking, hey, with season 14 coming, it's going to be a really cool, clean slate to say, okay, season 14, let's hit it. Yes. Hit the ground running. I love it. It's going to be a lot of fun. You know what we need to do? We need to stream like an Unreal Tournament party. I'm really looking forward to that. And, and maybe we'll do that with the TENS machine. Maybe that'll be something that <laughs> anytime, anytime you, you 
anytime you get a headshot on me, I'm pushing the button. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna camp in the corner. <laughs> he's not there, he's not there. <laughs> Whenever I see the Redeemer flying around with Jeff's <laughs> name above it, I'm just gonna push the button that takes. Uh, oh. kills <laughs> <laughs> That's gonna be brilliant, can't wait. Oh, folks, Good show. It's been great having you here and I look forward to seeing you again next week. Take care, everybody, see ya. Bye.